Um, I am one of the pediatric emergency docs at Children's, and I've been kind of all over the country doing disaster work in all the hospitals I've been at. So um, I both work at Children's and then have been other places too. So this first hour is gonna be a lot of information and much less fun than the second hour, but the second hour I think is gonna be a, a great way to practice a lot of what we're done. Um, and like I said, get through this first one with your coffee and then the second one's got a lot more interaction um, with my partners. So um, this is, because we live in Colorado, uh, other places I get to give the title, which says, I hope it never happens here. Um, we live in Denver and this has happened a couple of times here. So I don't get to say that. So many of you may have already responded to MCIs with kids and have a lot of firsthand information. Um, if you need to step off, I totally understand. Um, I've tried not to make things really graphic and a lot more um, just information for everyone. Um, so let me see if I can technologically make this work. Okay, nope, that won't work that way. There we go. Uh, let me minimize that. So this is a very, very bad day. Um, a school bus crashes into a liquid transport semi-truck on I-25 at the I-25 and 70 interchange in Denver. So a pretty populated area. The bus was fully loaded with kindergartners on their way to the zoo. This was pre-pandemic when we actually had travel and school. Um, you get a call from your dispatcher. The passerbys have called in that there's a lot of cars involved and at least one school bus in this horrible crash. Unfortunately, you are gonna be the first rig on scene. And like I said, it's a bad day. You have about five minutes till you get there and you and your partner are trying to figure out what you're gonna do first. So you're coming up with your plan as you're driving. The goal of this talk is to give you that, what am I gonna do and know what to do, um, at least as much as anyone can. So some background as to why I care. So in Hurricane Katrina, those of you who are young won't remember this, but those of you who are my age will. We were the wealthiest nation in the world. We were hit with a predicted hurricane. We knew it was gonna hit New Orleans. There was almost no planning, no evacuation. We assumed everyone could get out in their own car and had plenty of gas stored in their garage. In this horrible disaster for many, many people, about 5,000 children were separated from their families. It took six months until the last child got back to their families. I cannot imagine being that child or those parents. And I never, ever, ever, ever want to have this happen again anywhere in the world. So that's part of the reason I care. One of the reasons that I know that talking about this helps is that in the Boston Marathon bombing, again, those of you who are young may not remember this, there was a horrible bombing. And because the EMS folks and the fire folks and PD, the PD had prepared and planned and had amazing triage tents up, there were 30 red tag patients. They were all transported within an hour. Almost 300 patients required hospital treatment. And the only three deaths happened at the scene. No one who got to a hospital died. It was amazing response. And I've talked to some of the people who were in charge of that and they had planning down to a key. And that's why so few people died in a horrific packed act, act of terror. I happened to be in Cleveland when we actually won the NBA title. And I was working that day. We had no emergency plan. This was an un, we knew that there was gonna be this parade. We had no idea this is what it was gonna look like. Um, 45 kids were, ended up separated from their families. Fortunately, by the end of the day, we had gotten them all back together. There weren't any fatalities. There was one gunshot. Um, but we had no plan for reunification or for how to take care of this many people. If something awful had happened here, it would have been a catastrophe. Las Vegas is another just a heroic EMS story, frankly. Um, over 800 people were injured. There were almost 60 people killed. There were 200 responding ambulances from 13 different agencies, three separate ambulance companies. They transported over 400 people to 13 different hospitals. I don't know how people found the courage to keep showing up to this scene because there was not a safe evacuation zone for any of our EMS providers or fire providers for at least two hours until the, from the start of the incident. And 200 ambulances showed up anyway. And that's why I get to talk with you guys. 
Um, it's such a privilege. Okay, so with that background, what do we need to, to do now? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of my perspective from disaster preparedness overview, and then we're really gonna focus on why kids are different, and then how to care for kids in a disaster. And then in the next hour, you get a lot more practice, and you're gonna find out a little bit more about what children's does, and a lot of practical stuff that you can sort of take back. So the scope of the problem. We don't know where or when the next MCI will occur. There are mass shoot shootings before the pandemic almost every day. A quarter of the population is technically pediatrics. And for many, 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 many years, planning for children was under a paragraph listed special populations in a 40 to 80 page document. Um, those of us who do pediatrics thinks that, think that that's way too little. <laughs> The other thing is that no one likes to think about mass casualty in children. It is emotionally incredibly hard to deal with. It's incredibly hard for most people to take care of one critically ill child, let alone multiple. And we know that. Those of us in pediatrics get pretty used to it one at a time. A mass casualty doesn't feel normal to us either. And we know that those of you who take care of mostly adults, this is going to just rip your heart into shreds and we know that and we want to provide, help you to get through it if you ever have to. So kids are at really high risk of injury from a couple of things. Hazardous material exposure, bioterrorism, chemical warfare, mass casualty incidents like shootings and other things like earthquakes, hurricanes and natural disasters. And then mass shootings, which has unfortunately been most of the pediatric mass casualties in this country so far, since at least since Katrina. And there's a couple of things that make kids special. And I am a peds ER doc, which means I don't like to think in complex ways. I like to think in very concrete ways. There's a couple of things that are pretty obvious when you think about them, um, but they help me to think through it. Kids are short. They can't travel. They're not good at getting themselves out of dangerous. They're small and with really fragile torsos. They don't have good musculature. They don't have a really rigid chest wall. They don't have a big ab abdominal wall that protects them. Because they're littler, they're much more thin skinned, particularly infants and toddlers. They don't have this thicker skin on their, you know, you've ever seen them. They get irritated much faster than adults. They breathe a lot. They breathe fast and much more quickly than uh, adults do. So they're gonna take in more toxin and they're gonna need more, they have less reserve than adults. They use more energy. Anybody who's on Zoom with your toddlers or school age kids trying to keep them quiet during this talk knows that. But metabolically, they run through things really quickly. So if there's a toxin that affects metabolism, they can be in trouble really, really fast. The other thing that makes them prone to a mass casualty situation is that when we're not in a pandemic, they're found in groups. So they're at school, they're at daycare, they're at the pool, they're at the park. And typically when they're in groups, they have less grown-ups around. And that makes them really vulnerable for a lot of different reasons. So a little bit more deep dive. So kids are short and they have really big heads. You all know this because you've done a ton of work with kids and you've been preparing for this. Some of the things that make them more at risk are that they have more likely to have serious head wounds, both from, plunt, sorry, both from blunt and penetrating trauma. Their heads are big, they're a big target. Because toxic gases in a hazmat kind of situation are, tend to be dangerous because they accumulate on the ground. They are heavier than air, they don't just go up and kids tend to be closer to the ground, so they are more likely to have higher exposure of toxic gases. Because they're on the ground, they can pick up particulate matter from the ground. Very few 40-year-olds walk around picking stuff off the ground and putting it in their mouths. Well, most toddlers do. So if there's something on the ground, like a radioactive particle or a hazmat particle, it can be congested where it would never be in a 40-year-old. In significant explosions or gunfire, they are because they are compact, a single bullet can do a whole lot of damage. A single piece of shrapnel can do a whole lot of damage. 
it, a single path takes it through multiple organs. Grown ups have more space. Kids can't travel. That's sort of the way I think about it. So, this is a developmental stages. So, babies can't get out of their cribs. If you put them down, they tend to be where they are. They need grown-ups or other people to move them out of danger. Toddlers and preschoolers can't get away from danger. If you do fire, you know that um, little kids are likely to hide in danger, which puts them in more danger. They don't know how to get out of it. They can't walk, they don't know to run away from a bomb. They don't know how to run away from a shooter. Older kids and even teenagers may have a really inappropriate response to danger, even though they know how to get out. So you're gonna have to really be careful with these kids. And then teenagers can move and may be able to be initially out of danger, but they have really no equipment to deal with the psychological trauma. And what you do at the scene is gonna help them through as much as you possibly can. You're not gonna take the trauma away, but you might be the person that keeps them from getting worse and worse. Kids are small. So their increased body surface area for weight, they lose heat and water really fast. They dehydrate quickly. They can become hypothermic quickly. They also, in heat situations, can have heat illness faster than adults. Because their chest walls are really compliant, they're squishy, you can have injury to the lung, the spleen, the liver, and kidneys much more quickly and with less force than you would an adult. Their ribs often don't break and you can have a ton of transmitted um, forces to those internal organs. Their abdominal organs are really close together and they're much, they tend to be lower down and they're not as protected by the rib cage. They also don't tend to have a big layer of fat and abdominal wall musculature to protect them. Um, it turns out that as adults we do and toddlers don't. Hypovolemia occurs really quickly. They don't have much blood to lose and they're harder to tell. Because kids will keep their blood pressure normal almost until they're dead, looking for that really um, increased heart rate is really key. But it's also really hard in the field to know if your toddler is 180 eats per minute because they're screaming and hurt or because they're about to crump on you. Because they're small, that increased risk from hazardous exposure. So it doesn't take much of a dose to really hurt them. Um, if you've ever seen a kid after a single pill ingestion that was dangerous, it's the same principle. A little dose of a toxin is really dangerous. And then dosing an antidote is really tricky. A lot of the auto injectors are really meant for adults and there are a few pediatric auto injectors, but they're hard to find um, and most people don't stock them. In trauma, as we've talked about, they're less protected by all of their musculature. You can see increased multi-organ trauma. You can see increased abdominal and thoracic trauma from smaller, smaller forces. And then if you're dealing with kids that are burned, they will dehydrate and become hypovolemic really fast. They will also become hypothermic. Anytime you take the skin off something or injure the skin, people are at really high risk for hypothermia and kids are even more. I'm going to make sure that I want time while we're talking about skin. So because they're thin skinned, they will increase, they will have increased toxin absorption through the skin. And one of the things that you might see really commonly is hydrocarbons. So if a kid has gasoline spray, um, splashed on their skin and we don't get it off, they can actually absorb it and have toxic cardiac effects from the, the gasoline. They will also have increased chemical burns from that. Um, so increased heat loss during a burn, during decontamination, or just being exposure. If you're out in a, a scene of a mass casualty and everyone's sitting outside and it's 50 degrees, eh, the teenagers are probably gonna be okay, but the infants and toddlers may be in really significant danger of hypothermia. Caustic ages, agents cause a lot more damage. If you've ever spilled something that burns on your, the inner the part of your inner part of your wrist, you know that that's much thinner skin than on your foot. It's the same idea with babies. Um, so like an acid or a base injury where on my hand, it might be okay. On a toddler, they don't have much um, keratin built up. So they're going to have a lot more injury.
So kids breathe fast and they have increased respiratory volumes as well. So if something is aerosolized or vaporized into the atmosphere, they're going to have a much more, um, they're going to have a bigger dose than an adult. They also are more affected by asphyxiants, things like carbon monoxide, um, cyanide. Those are all things that you're going to see much faster uh, injury in children. Because their airways are small, a little edema goes a really long way. So a caustic uh, substance that you breathe in, um, in an adult, might have, you, know, you might have some strider, you might have some difficulty breathing, you're going to be irritated. In a kid, you could have edema that really compromises their ability to breathe. It's also really hard to decide, decide if a kid is sludging from cholinergic exposure or just crying and snotty. So identifying hazmat might be much harder if all you have are, are toddlers exposed as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So kids also use more energy and most of the kids up here are mine at different stages. Um, they have higher metabolic rates. They're gonna have a higher respiratory rate, higher heart rate. Like we talked about just a few minutes ago, the asphyxiates cause damage faster. You can also see more potent changes with toxins and hypovolemia can be really high, hard to identify, particularly if you have 10, 15, 20 crying toddlers, preschoolers. You're not gonna be able to know if their heart rate is 150 because she's crying or is she hypovolemic and really scary. And that's really hard at the scene. And I'll acknowledge that and know that it's much, much harder at the scene than it is in the hospital. And I know that, and I wanna sort of let you know that we know that too. <laughs> so this is why I think that looking at kids and their vital signs is so important. And I know that there are a ton of, you know, lots of other hospitals have um, vital signs cards. And my pediatric residents really carry these until they're at least they're in their third year because it's hard to know. And having it in your pocket is really helpful, particularly if you're in a really high stress situation. So pull that out, totally fine to do. The things to remember is that the smaller they are, the higher their heart rate and respiratory rate at baseline, and the less likely that blood pressure will be useful for you. It's going to be normal in kids really into their teens until they are almost ready to die. So if the blood pressure drops, you are minutes from cardiovascular collapse. So don't wait. The other flip side of that is that if you call me and tell me that you have a patient who is bradycardic, if you have a four-year-old whose heart rate is 65, I'm going to be really, really worried. Um, because bradycardia tends to be ominous in kids. When they're in stress, they don't become bradycardic unless, they're about, unless bad things are happening. So as this used to be more true, <laughs> kids are usually found in groups. And even now in the pandemic, they still are. Our kids are still going to preschool. They're still going to daycare. And a lot of our elementary school, kid, school kids are lucky enough to be in, sc in school together. And this is where they are probably the most vulnerable because they're not with parents who can know about them. They, the people who are with them may or may not know about their health concerns and there's large numbers of them. So in schools, in daycares, buses, it used to be that you could visit a museum or a water park. These things used to be open and hopefully they still will be. Um, and this is where they're really vulnerable. It also makes them targets for people who are trying to do injury to children. So I'm going to stop just for a minute because I, I don't have my, thing, um, my looking at it thing on. Are there any questions or anything that? Kristen, there aren't any questions that have come through the chat box. Um, okay. But I think, you know, one thing when we're out teaching in terms of our EMS outreach is for our intents and purposes, we talk a lot about the similarities between kids and adults, right? And so I think this is really good to highlight a lot of the differences when dealing with some of these mass disasters. So, that, so thanks for pointing all that out. I think it's a terrific perspective. Okay, then I'm gonna make it so that I can't see myself again, otherwise I, I don't pay attention. Um, so yeah, in a lot of things that they are similar, and none of this is earth shaking to anyone who's ever been around a child. So 
This isn't stuff that you don't know. This is just reminding you of the things that you already do know. Um, so translating that into, so now what? Um, so when I'm planning for pediatric disasters, there's some really basic things that I think about. So in a disaster, the things that kids need are basic. And the key one that I will drill into everyone's head every, until I die is that in a disaster, kids need to be kept with their grownups because that prevents a ton of downstream problems. So if you can do take nothing away from this talk other than, huh, I probably shouldn't separate them unless I absolutely have to. And if I have to separate them, I need a plan to get them back together. That's the one point from the entire hour. The other things that they need is they need to be warm. They need to be kept safe from further harm. They also need to have their injuries treated. And sometimes because kids are so scary and it just breaks our little, it breaks our hearts and it breaks ours too, um, this can be harder to do. They also need to eat and pee and poop. And teenagers, that's pretty easy. Toddlers and babies, we need to plan for it because we're not gonna have the right stuff in our hospitals, in our if, you know, triage tents. You know, if, you, if you are in a mass disaster and you, it's gonna take six hours to get everyone away from the scene, somebody needs to be going to get some diapers. Somebody needs to be going to get some formula um, because you're gonna have to be doing some of these things in place to prevent further harm. Or particularly if you're working at, at one of the hospitals, um, that is less pediatric specified. So if you're in a general emergency department or a hospital that sees a few kids a week or a few kids a day, this is stuff that you're gonna to wanna to be planning for. And a lot of our paramedic and EMT colleagues, um, many of you do double, double duty. So, and you may be the only person who really cares about this at your institution. Um, so I wanna make sure you know that too. The other thing that helps psychologically, kids need to get back to normal as soon as possible. They need to know that the grownups are in charge, that there are rules, and as much as you can, get back to that. We've sort of seen that in this pandemic, all of us with our families, and um, the more rules we, we can keep in place, if there are any at this point, <laughs> it's good. So a little bit more. Keep kids with their families. The reasons for this is that it's much easier to keep, do a physical exam. It's much easier to treat patients when they're in their patient, parents' laps. It also keeps them from getting hurt secondarily. A three-year-old wandering around the trauma scene is a danger to themselves and are likely to get hurt again. It also minimizes the psychological trauma that kids get. It decreases their anxiety. It decreases their pain. It also prevents the need for reunification. And reunification of separated parents and kids is the thing that keeps those of us who do this sort of primarily in our research up at night. None of us have a great plan. We all are gonna be making this up on the, as we go, and the more we can prevent it, the better. If you do need to separate them, and there will be cases where you do, the more you can do to document who the kid came with and where their parents are going, Ideally, even write it on them. <laughs> I belong to so-and-so. Um, a Sharpie is a great tool. The more that you can do that, will make it easier on the back end to get those families back together and to keep kids safe. Again, this is basic. Kids need to be warm. On scene, look for hypothermia and treat it. The adults might be okay, but the babies and infants might not be. If you need to decontaminate, it's a huge risk for hyper, sorry, hypothermia. Um, if you can, use warm water and heaters. If you're on scene, that might be really, really tricky. The really key thing is to dry them off quickly, get warm blankets, do as much as you can to prevent heat loss. If they're coming to you, you wanna look for presenting hypothermia or heat illness and make sure that they're getting warmed. Look for it because you made it. That you may be the only person who's thinking about it in the middle of the trauma bay if you're working in a hospital. While you're waiting for evacuation, make sure that you're preventing any further heat or cold illness injury. Get passive warming, get blankets, huddle them together, get them shelter if you can. All of us know that significant trauma and cold leads to bad outcomes. The more that you can keep the normothermic, the better. And that's really much harder 
in the completely uncontrolled scene that you guys are at than it is where I am. And I recognize that and I appreciate what you guys do. Kids need to be kept safe. And this is where it gets really hard. The incident scene is very, very unlikely to be safe for kids. The more that you can get them to a safe spot quickly, the better. Find a safe place for them to wait. Keep them with someone who's an approved adult supervisor, somebody who's been through that background check. This prevents second injury to kids. Kids gathered after a tra traumatic thing are at incredibly high risk. They can be abducted, they can be exploited. It turns out that unfortunately, all grown-ups are not safe grown-ups. And we wanna prevent any further injury to these kids. If you're working in a hospital, make sure that your disaster plan has a place to keep kids while they're waiting for grown-ups, while they're waiting for their treatment. Make sure that you don't have a spot where, like most of our exam rooms, where the outlets are just waiting for a small finger, where there's not sharp things to be grabbed. And that's easier said than done. And kids need medical treatment. You guys are gonna be the first people who do that. So use the pediatric appropriate triage tools. None of them are perfect. Jumpstart, salt, whatever you've got, it gives you somewhere to start. It also emotionally gives you a place to take a deep breath and go, I can start this. I can go to the first patient, I can do this, because it's gonna be really, really hard not just to lose it if there's children involved. And I know you guys are experts at not losing it on the scene, but when there's a lot of kids, it makes it so much harder. The more that you can just fall back on those, it's the better. And they're not perfect. We know they're not perfect, they're just what we have. Disaster medical plans always have to have provisions to take care of kids to identify them, stabilize them, transport them, treat them. If you're working in a spot that mostly doesn't see a lot of children, you wanna find your pediatric experts in the area. It's possible that one of your ER nurses used to do OB or used to do pediatrics. Maybe one of your family practice docs is really great at pediatrics and that's their thing. Maybe one of the paramedics happens to have a huge interest in this and has gone to like a ton of talks. You might be the pediatric expert in your area. That would be great. I would listen to the folks that know what they're doing. Have a list of people who are good at babies. Listen, have a list of people who are good at, crit at special needs kids. And then prepare plans for both transport and shelter in place. In Colorado and in this region, we really do know that sometimes you can't get out. We know that sometimes the roads are closed, that you can't fly. And you wanna make sure that you can take care of kids the best you can where you are. Treat pain. Kids don't show pain in the same way that adults do sometimes. I've seen a ton of three and four year olds that just shut down and they don't cry. And I'm looking at them and I'm looking at their femur and their femur is doing this. <laughs> it's a big, huge angle and it's not great. And I'll have folks that are transporting them, usually from a hospital, usually not from the scene because usually my EMS folks are really on top of pain. Saying, well, I gave him Tylenol. He didn't look like he was in pain and their heart rate's 150. And then when I get them and we do some fentanyl or if EMS gets them into the rig and they're like, this seems really, really painful. And they do a little intranasal version of fentanyl and suddenly their heart rate's 120 and they're talking to you and they're chatting. You've got to treat the pain and then you also need to treat the injuries. So kids need to have their injuries identified. So the triage system is your first stop. And you're gonna have a lot of practice with this in a few minutes. Use that good old fashioned pediatric assessment triangle. Particularly if you can't remember start or salt to save your life in the middle of a trauma, that's okay. If they look sick, they probably are. Look for intrathoracic and abdominal trauma. It's going to be more subtle than you think. Don't get fooled by that stable blood pressure. That's an adult thing. Look for shock. High heart rate, normal blood pressure, that might be shock. I had mentioned this before, bradycardia in an injured kid is ominous to me. It makes me worry about a head, it makes me worry about a head, sorry, a head injury, it makes me worry about impending cardiovascular collapse. If they're not breathing fast, particularly little ones, that gets my attention as well. A 10-year-old breathing eight times a minute worries me much more than a 10-year-old breathing 30 times a minute. 
if you're in a place where you can see cap refill and you have the luxury of not having it be below zero, look at the cap refill, look at the skin perfusion, particularly once you're transporting these kids, if you're the person transporting, watch that. And then assume kids do feel no pain, just like you would. If you think it would be painful, you're probably right. Go ahead and treat them. And I apologize for the font on this one. This did not come out as I expected, I apologize. So fall back on your basics. Airway, position the airway. Breathing, go ahead and put oxygen on. There are a few kids who can't have oxygen and they tend to have people around them who know that. Primarily it's the um, congenital heart kids that can't have extra oxygen, but they tend to be well known and hopefully their parents have talked with you if they live in your community. Circulation, go ahead and give that fluid. Not too much, a 20 cc per kilo bolus. Use your Braslo tape, use whatever tape you have, whatever that weight or size-based tape that you use to estimate, use it. If you need to apply a tourniquet, go ahead, please apply the tourniquet and put it on tight. Watch the rest of the body for cap refill, treat their pain. C-spine might be important, go ahead and put that in. And then splint any obvious fractures. That'll help with the pain, that'll help with all sorts of other things. If you have burned patients, particularly if you have multiple burns, honestly, a dry, clean sheet helps a ton. It protects the burn, it keeps the air currents from going over it, decreases pain, and it keeps um, contamination out of the wounds. And it's simple, and often you have them. This tends to be for more of a prolonged scene or in the hospital, but kids are gonna need to eat, and babies can't eat pizza. So you're gonna to have to have appropriate food. You're gonna have places for them to sleep, cribs, pack and plays, uh, diapers, clean water, low cots. You don't wanna put five kids up on a high exam table, they'll fall off. You also wanna make sure that they're safe in their bed and that we're not causing injury. And then as much as we can get them back to normal, we should. We wanna have those reunification plans in place. We want to identify kids who can't tell you who they are so we can figure out who they are. And as soon as you can, we should restart schools, lessons, normalcy, having a schedule and structure and rules. Even if you're in the hospital waiting for something, the more that you can have nap time and play time, and we're gonna eat lunch now. You know, if you're waiting for things to happen, the more that you can do that, the better and then allow kids to play. Even if you're on scene, if you've got a long, if you've got all the kids are fine and you're having a long transport time, give them something to do. Find some teenager that can play uh, Red Rover, Red Rover, or play Simon Says, or any of those things to keep them distracted. And avoid secondary medical trauma if we can. The more that we can be kind to our, these kids, the more that we can um, help take care of their pain, the better. This is where my nightmare scenario comes in. So kids that are unidentified or don't have grown-ups are hard. The more information you can record about where they're found and what, they, what you know about them, the better. And it may be really weird things like what color their teddy bear is, where they were found, who they were with when they were found, who brought the kid to you, who brought the kid to the hospital. Any other information, if you find out what their pet's name is, that's useful to know. That can help with reunification later on. Their siblings, if they're telling you that they live in a brown house, write it down. Those of us in the hospital later are going to be having to, you know, when somebody comes in and says, oh, I belong to that child and I live in a blue house. And I'm like, no, I live in a brown house. That helps us to know that this might not be a safe grown up. Make sure that you have adults identified to care for these kids. It doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, but you do need to have somebody responsible for each kid. Make sure that you've got a safe area to keep them. Particularly either when they're in transport, before transport, or at the hospital. Use a triage tag, use duct tape, use a Sharpie, whatever you've got to identify that parent-child pair so that we can get them back together if you need to separate them. The more that you can do that on scene, I cannot tell you how important that is for families and for kids and for safety. And we appreciate all that you do.
Okay, I'm gonna stop for a second before I jump into triage and make sure we've got time. That's right. Any questions at all? There was just one comment about um, adult tourniquets and yeah. that they can be a little bit challenging to kind of get a really nice tight fit on a kiddo, obviously depending on the size of the kid. Um, and they mentioned using like a blood pressure cuff, like a pediatric blood pressure cuff. Do you have any thoughts on tourniquets in general for kiddos? I think in a mass casualty situation, that's probably, if you can't get the adult one to be tight enough, that's probably better. Make sure that they don't have pulses because you don't want to be below the tourniquet. You don't want to just cause venous congestion and have arterial coming through. Um, so look for a pulse beforehand, make sure that you get it, get it on. Um, and there's going to be improvisation, unfortunately, in an MCI. That's better than nothing, I think. You can talk with my trauma surgeon, both friends as well, and they may have a different opinion, but that's my guess. Um, I think that's probably a, a reasonable solution, but make sure that you're not having arterial flow through the tourniquet. Okay, and I'm looking at my time as well to make sure that I'm reasonably respectful. So I'm going to go through the triage stuff a little bit fast because you're going to hit it. I know that we're going to hit that in the next hour. My approach to triage is that this tells me who's going to die, who's going to die no matter what I do, and who I can save. And we're gonna, red is the, I think about as seriously injured, but I can save them with what I've got. Yellow is they could get really sick. They're going to need treatment. They're not likely to die yet. Green, they can wait, but they could turn bad, especially kids. And then the black, blue, expectant, uh, palliative, whatever you want to call that term. These are people who are seriously injured, who need care from us, but we're not going to be able to save. These are people that having someone give them attention who's not medical, hold their hand, provide pain medication. That's what I would say do. Um, we're human and the more that we can do that, the better that is. But I can't save them. I can't save their life given what we have. And I know we're going to go through this later. So I'm going to skip the salt triage. The ba uh, main points for me is that uh, rescue breaths are great and respiratory distress are, is hard to identify in kids. And then I know that we're going to hit that in the next hour. So your day just got worse. You get close to the scene and you notice a huge plume of smoke near the area. As you start pulling up with your rig, you notice that the fire department that can meet you there and the law enforcement folks are coughing and having watering eyes. And the two of you look at each other and go, oh no. <laughs> so these are pretty easy to identify as hazardous material. They look like it from the outside. Um, hazardous material is defined as chemical or radioactive substances that when exposed to people cause harm to the patient, risk of harm to others, and maybe to the environment. But gasoline is also hazardous material. This we see a lot more, and I've seen a lot more dangerous um, events from gasoline than I have from almost any other hazmat. So a car crash with a gasoline leak can be hazmat. This is what we have right now, what we're talking about, which is hazardous material plus an MCI. This is a bad day. So I know that everyone here knows about hazardous materials. We taught, you guys have been taught, you guys know decon, you know how to do this at the scene. Things are not that much different with kids. You know what you're doing. The basic principles still apply. If you think that there's a hazardous material, use your toxidromes to identify it, suspect it, and then think about decontamination, both to protect you so that you can transport these kids safely and to protect them. Use your PPE. There is, if you go down, I have no one else to be replaced with you with. So you need to get your PPE on and you need to be safe first. And then again, like I've said throughout this, keep kids with their family during the evaluation, decontamination and treatment and particularly through decontamination. It's gonna make your job much, much easier if kids are with their grownups. In light of time, I'm not going to go through a ton of the toxidromes. I've got them in the, the PowerPoint, and I'm going to go through them. If you're interested, if this is something that you really want more information on, we'll have the PowerPoint available to you, um, and you can look at it. I think of them as irritant gases, asphyxiants, cholinergic, and the cholinergic is important because there's an antidote, and then corrosive, and then hydrocarbons. 
reasons to suspect hazmat. So if you start seeing a lot of people at the scene with respiratory distress, coughing, wheezing, tachypnea, grabbing their chests, if they all have burning eyes and noses and mouths and they're tearing, if you start seeing those sludge signs for cholinergic, so salivation, lacrimation, you probably won't notice the urination, diarrhea, um, and GI pain, but you might see vomiting. And think about cholinergic substance because you've got something that you can do something about. That's where the two PAM and atropine are gonna come in. If you start seeing a lot of people with skin irritation that doesn't make sense, pain or vesicles, and I misspelled that, I'll fix that later. If you start seeing people with mental status changes or seizures, start thinking about hazardous materials. Both so you can be protected as well as so that you can protect other people. There's some things that are obvious. If you have a hazmat sign on a truck that's hit a school bus, that's an easy one. Um, so if you have a known risk, if you're going to a chemical plant, if you're going to a plant where you know the hazmat, hopefully someone that already mentioned that to you on your way there. But other people might be thinking about other things. Um, I had a trauma patient come into the trauma bay and environmental services was there helping to take care of some linens and we worked in a place where we had a culture where anyone could say anything and this gentleman had the courage to come up and say hey doc i smell gas do you smell gas and i stopped in the middle of this trauma and i was like yeah i do thank you so much and we stopped and we decontaminated that patient and we kept the rest of us from having cns changes so I wasn't high on gasoline when I was taking care of this patient. They didn't end up with a chemical burn. They didn't end up with a cardiac arrhythmia because somebody in that room was paying attention. Um, and I went back and thanked them because they really saved that person. Um, so remember that gasoline is a hazardous material and is really dangerous, particularly if you're driving in an enclosed rig with a patient. Um, there's a reason that teenagers like to huff gasoline. It gets you high and driving high is a bad idea. I'm, going to, I'm not going to go through these. Like I said, they'll be in the talk. I didn't want to make sure that we're respecting time. And then there's a, there's a two tables if you want to do the quick one. So a couple of key points from chemical exposures. In a fire, you're already thinking about this. You're thinking about cyanide, carbon monoxide. In a smoldering plastic fire, you're thinking phosgene. You may or may not have a cyano kit on board. You know that you're going to give 100% oxygen by face mask. Um, think about decontamination, and then sludge signs for nerve gas or organophosphates. These tend to be the pesticides that you'll see in agricultural spots. And this is where 2-PAM and atropine are really important. The 2-PAM stops this from becoming a permanent problem. The atropine treats the symptoms. Um, and then hydrocarbons, gasoline is dangerous. So when I start thinking about decontamination, you have to figure out who needs decontamination because it's not without risks. Putting someone into PPE with a full um, PAPR with a filter with an oxygen tank causes risks to the people who are in the PPE and the people who are being decontaminated. So these guys probably don't, but the previous one might have. So the three questions I think about is, is there a hazardous material exposure? Does it pose a risk to the patient? And does it pose a risk to others? If all three of those are yes, then the first thing you need to do is decontaminate the patient. Because if it poses a risk to you and the patient, we have to make sure that you can be safe first so that you can take care of your patient. Even if the patient is coding. Because if you go down with that hazmat contamination, you can't take care of the next person and you can't take care of this person. And I think that my um, EMS colleagues are really good about scene safety. My other folks that work in the hospital are really bad at it. So I don't think I have to make this into your heads. Um, my colleagues, I, this is a hard, a hard step. So protect yourself first, get their clothes off. That's about 80 to 90% of the, the contamination in most scenarios. Brush off any debris. And then lots of low pressure warm water washcloth and baby soap is my favorite. If there's ID contamination on eye wash, you're not going to be putting a Morgan lens in an MCI situation or in the field. And I'm not either in an MCI. I'm just going to be doing anything eye wash. A couple of differences in kids. We are scary in hazmat suits, although kids are getting really used to us in hazmat suits because of what we're looking like now. 
So in infants, they are slippery. My favorite decontamination tool is a laundry basket. You can put a baby or a toddler in it. They don't fall out. They're not going to drown. Uh, and they're a lot easier to pick up without dropping them and then dry them off afterwards. In the little kids, the more that you can keep them with their grown-ups, the better it's going to be. Again, treat them like your elderly patients. Their skin can be injured by high pressure or hot water, just like an elderly patient would be. These kids might be really modest and they might need a before and after gown or to sort of be mindful of that because it's going to be scary to do this. Some kids don't like being in a shower at home, much less in the middle of a field. Unfortunately, we've sort of all learned about pandemics in kids. We never expected the pandemic illnesses that I prepared for to, to leave kids alone. I am immensely grateful that they do right now. But in case we see the next one, again, kids with their families, vaccinate when we can, and then they can have different responses to illnesses just like we're seeing with COVID. And I promise that's the last response time I mentioned that word. Um, they can have increased respiratory distress. They have increased risks of dehydration. And the pediatric definition of the disease doesn't always look like the adult definition. Biological weapons are something that we think about and um, is more a keep your eyes open than do something about. There's a couple of things and the CDC and the WHO classify them into priority for preparedness. The highest ones, there's six of them, are anthrax, smallpox, botulism, plague, tularemia, and then the viral hemorrhagic fevers. And that's sort of defined by how infectious they are, how dangerous they are, and how easy they are to weaponize. So the main things to be looking for as you are going about your day are some weird things. You're not going to need decon because this doesn't tend to be a decon decontamination kind of thing. If we know that there's a release, then you could consider it, but that tends to be really unlikely. It's really symptom track. If you're seeing weird symptoms or really unusual severity of common symptoms, if you're seeing a lot of really high fevers that look different than you usually see, if you're seeing really sudden onset of severe cough or difficulty breathing, or weird clusters of diseases of people that you don't usually see getting sick, or some of the characteristic rashes and signs. If you're starting to see, if you see buboes, think plague. If you're seeing vesicles that look like smallpox, think smallpox. Um, if you're seeing a lot of patients with weird purpura or bruising or bleeding, that's weird. Uh, and that's where you want to start talking with your public health folks and report what you're seeing, because often you see more than anyone else. So that we have some time, there's three main things if you can remember from this talk, is keep kids with their grownups. Kids have different injury patterns from grownups, and their injuries may show up differently. Watch their vital signs. Hypotension and bradycardia are really ominous, so watch for the earlier signs if you can. And then we really appreciate what you do. I think that's the end of what I've got. Oh, reunification, that's sort of the hospital stuff. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's gonna be hard to follow up Kristen on this, but we're gonna try our best. Um, real quick, as soon as I learn how to work Tim's computer. Um, quick objectives for this next hour is make you all aware of their current children's hospital decon capabilities per location, perform SALT triage, increase the understanding of hospital MCI process, speak to the management of our expectant decon or expectant triage category and recognize the signs and stress of your team and yourself. So as Jason said, our team here is Children's Emergency Response Team. We are the disaster preparedness group for children's that um, focus on decon hazmat, our highly infectious disease, patient evacuation, MCI, um, code silver, fire evacuation, active shooter. Those are the topics that this group specializes in. And this is all we do for children's. Um, so real quickly for our children's decon capabilities, here at the Anschutz campus, we are very fortunate to have built-in decon showers. Some of you may have come and seen these. We have two decon shower rooms, both heated, both negative airflow rooms. One is six dedicated ambulatory showers with six stalls on Anschutz. And right next door to that is a 
room that is same requirements, um, heated water that is four dedicated non-ambulatory showers. Um, and you can see our max output per hour. At our Highlands Ranch site, we this is the one-off location for our system that still utilizes the old fashioned yellow decon tents. Um, so as you all are aware, it takes a little longer to set up this tent. Functionality is a little bit slower. So our numbers at our South Campus Highlands Ranch site tend to be a little bit lower than the rest of the system. Our new North Campus Broomfield Hospital location has a dedicated built-in shower system as well. Only three showers, so two dedicated ambulatory, one dedicated non-ambulatory. And then our Colorado Springs Hospital has um, six dedicated internal showers as well, five dedicated to ambulatory showers, and one dedicated to non-ambulatory showers. Um, in addition to these showers, all of our ED staff, all of our nurses, EMTs and paramedics, behavioral health specialists, everybody who functions in the ED is trained on DECON and MCI every year. So they are quite proficient in DECON process for these patients. So our disaster triage categories, we're gonna go through SALT. Uh, just kind of a quick overview, your red triage category is that emergent threat to life, limb or organ, needing immediate medical treatment usually your critical care or ACLS. Your yellow is your urgent significant injury or illness, can accept some delays in care. ACLS if necessary, BLS is usually specialty experience required. And then green is your non-urgent, can safely wait for treatment, minimal non-urgent treatment is needed. And then your black triage category is your patients who have expired or are expected to expire, where you have palliative care and comfort measures in play. So our SALT triage that we used at Children's stands for sort, assess, life-saving interventions, and, tri and triage. You get four life-saving interventions that we try that are you're controlling major hemorrhage by placing your cat tourniquets, opening the airway of the patient if they're a child considered doing two rescue breaths, chest decompressions or needle decompressions, and then our auto-injector antidotes for hazardous materials. You always start off with, is the patient breathing? If they're not, you get to open their airway, consider the two rescue breaths if they're a child. If it works, that's amazing. If it doesn't, unfortunately, this is where we're telling our staff that in an MCI, you need to move on. And we talk to our staff about the black tag category just because we know it causes a lot of anxiety. If they are breathing, you move down to your five questions of do they obey commands? Do they have purposeful movement? Do they have peripheral pulses? Are they not in respiratory distress? And is major hemorrhage controlled? If all of those are yes, you move over to assessing inner injuries. If they're minor injuries only, they're tagged as a green. If they are not minor injuries, they are tagged as a yellow. If any one of these questions is a no, you go down to are they likely to survive given resources? If they are, you can tag them as a red. And if they are not, this is where we have that expectant category within the black tag, but you can also reassess constantly and move patients as needed. So we are gonna play a little game. This is where your pen and paper are gonna come into play. We'll have you make a category for green, yellow, red, and black, and just have enough room that you can make tally marks. We are gonna put up 50 patient cards that have very minimal patient information on them. And I am just gonna move that really quick so it's out of the way. Has very minimal patient information and just assess really quickly. Each card will be up for about five seconds before the next one pops up and you will triage green, yellow, red, or black. Any questions before we start? No, but I'm excited. All right, <laughs> we'll get going.
All right. So what we are going to have everyone do is quickly count up all of your tally marks, have a number ready for each category. And while you're doing that, we are going to end up comparing all of our results. You can go ahead, type your results into the chat box. The reason we do this is to show how different salt triages can go. Salt triage has proven to be the most accurate of all the triage algorithms currently, and it's accurate 56% of the time. So what we are gonna have everyone do is once you've started typing them in, we'll go over the results. So it's looking like so far eight to 21 green is our range. Eight to 25, 25 refusals. <laughs> Eleven to twenty two yellow. Ten to twenty one red. One to three black. So you all can see the major difference in triage and numbers that are being compared. So we're going to show you the results from a hospital standpoint. Looks like 25 green, 15 yellow, eight red and two black patients for our triage results. So you can see how wide and different the results can be for salt triage and why it's gonna be okay to have those different results and why we constantly do reassessment. Okay, this is Marcy Ludwig, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our hospital's response to an MCI. Um, and I want to just real quick, just back to these results. Um, this is not each individual patient that you looked at. The results vary based on because the algorithm is so vague, and there's a lot of um, perception that could be different in um, the use of resources and minor versus major. So this is not really to say whether you're right or wrong. We just like to do this to show, um, do, do you tend to under triage? Do you tend to over triage? Just kind of give you an idea of how different um, each person's triage decisions can be. So in a hospital, um, we um, have a perception of how uh, EMS providers respond to an MCI. And this is kind of what we think. So we tend to think that um, an event occurs and um, EMS responds to the scene. They establish triage. They move all of their green patients, their ambulatory patients to a certain area, and then they start prioritizing and tra tagging the red and the yellow. Um, and then they, on, based on that priority, transport them to us and then we provide the care, right? It sounds so simple. Sounds like a very easy model to follow. But the problem is, is that we have this real world, right? Where we have um, an increasing incidence of these mass vi violence events, incidents um, that Dr. Kim was, did such a great job of reviewing for us. Um, so this very simple, simplistic model is not um, something that always is feasible as you guys well know much better than us. Um, but in the hospitals, we have um, a history of being, um, of not exercising 
or including in our exercise a practice of this disaster triage. The disaster triage is very different than the typical triage that we do. Um, and so we just don't do a great job of practicing it. We don't do a great job of practicing an influx of patients that is um, self-presenting to our emergency department that is skipping EMS um, care. We really love it when you guys bring us patients that are packaged and have vital signs and have a prior assessment. Um, and that is our favorite thing. And we don't practice often when um, maybe that process is broken. Um, we also don't do a great job of prioritizing how we're going to, um, or how, or practicing how we're going to prioritize um, sending patients to the OR or um, to procedures such as CT or things like that. So these are um, areas that are lacking typically that we are really trying to um, close gaps on. So the real world teaches us um, from real experiences, we have learned um, looking at um, different events that have happened, lessons, learns, and um, research data that um, EMS is, all, is not always able to establish structured triage areas um, due to a variety of concerns, which you guys know. Up to 80% of disaster victims in, in certain um, mass violence events um, seek hospital care without accessing EMS. Um, hospitals just can't rely on um, EMS to perform triage and decontamination for us, even though we love that. Um, so we have to be prepared to do it ourselves. Um, many times bystander or self-care is going to be the primary um, or the initial medical care that is provided. So um, us thinking that people will come with adequate bleeding control and, um, and supplies to do that is just not really um, accurate anymore. Um, there's frequently a lack of communication between the scene and the receiving hospitals. And you can see how easily that would happen um, just considering the dynamic nature of these events and um, how much there is to do and consider on the scene. Um, in numerous of these mass casualty events, um, the initial notification that hospitals receive is by that first arriving patients, either self-reporting or um, by EMS. And um, just really, if we can get a heads up notice of five to 10 minutes, then it is huge in our process um, to prepare for that. Um, so I'm gonna um, review some of our um, hospital process so that you can understand the information that we need and how to better prepare us to, um, to support you guys and our patients. Um, so just kind of an overview, characteristics of mass casual events. You guys probably um, are very well versed in this, but just to give some background before I go into my next um, talk or my next topic. Um, okay, so mass, the dynamic events that we're really talking about here are the ones that have multiple locations or the boundaries of the incident um, seem to change or um, mold as the event goes on. The scope and source may not be um, apparent as we're already arriving or patients are arriving to our hospital. So um, because of that, we really have to um, change the way that we respond. So coordination with EMS crew and hospitals is always super important, but in these dynamic events, it's even more important. Um, as an example, um, Las Vegas shooting, the Route 91 music festival shooting, you know, I'm sure you all are aware that Sunrise Hospital, a level three trauma center, received 188 patients by private vehicle, and um, they received around 20 patients by EMS. So coordination there with EMS, understanding how overwhelmed they were becoming is super important. Um, but our hospital is, we don't always think to send information out to EMS because we're always just used to receiving it from you guys. So we really need to um, remember to share with you how we're feeling and what resources um, are becoming overwhelmed for us. Um, of course, provider safety on both sides is really important. We know that rapid transport to the hospital is favored over um, pausing to track, tag patients and that type of thing. And we know that we have to be prepared for a large number of casualties walk in. Um, I just wanna review one event um, from a hospital perspective. So on June 12th of 2016, a gunman opened fire in the Orlando Pulse nightclub. Uh, 49 people were killed and um, 66 were wounded. We're just gonna talk through one hospital's experience in um, responding to this event. The trauma center 
was only a few blocks away from the nightclub. Um, they received 38 patients in 45 minutes. Um, they arrived by PD, they arrived by pickup trucks and EMS. Of um, that 38 patients, that first 38 patients, nine of them were pronounced dead on arrival or in that um, black tag category. Um, at 2 a.m., the ED staff had issues contacting staff. So many of their phones were on silence or charging in a separate room. Um, around 8.30 a.m., when staff started waking up and seeing the MCI alert on their phones, they started calling and saying, oh gosh, how can I help? Um, at the start of the event, two ORs were open, up and running because they are a level one trauma center. In 45 minutes, they had four um, additional ones open or for total up and running. And then 30 minutes later, they had all six of their ORs up and running, which is really pretty phenomenal and a really difficult feat. Um, at one point, they believed that one of the shooters had been brought in as a victim. Um, so three times they called the code silver, which for them is a restricted access. Um, it just really caused a lot of fear. It prevented movement um, and, and progress for patients being transported to um, different departments like the OR and um, the ICUs. Um, and I think this is one aspect that we um, is very sensitive to our, our teams. Um, they really appreciate your guys's partnership in making sure that the victims that are coming in are um, safe to come into our hospital. Um, the hospital switchboard received 6,000 calls between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. and another 5,000 the next morning. Um, I think that restricted access really um, contributed to this. It prevented um, family members from coming in to look for their loved ones. Um, but just know that, you know, this is something that we're facing in addition to caring for our patients. Um, after the initial wave of 38 patients, there was an 11 minute lull and um, really allowing incident command staff to replenish exhausted chest tube supplies from their pediatric um, hospital that was just on the same camp campus. Um, it's really um, poignant to me that it says 11 minutes. It's not about 10 minutes or we had a little break. <laughs> it's exactly 11 minutes. And um, that's where that communication just um, is so important to us um, so that we know that there's more coming so that we can, can continue to replenish our supplies and our staff and our resources as needed. Um, early in the event response, incident command arranged for 100 units of blood. In the first 24 hours, they ended up transfusing 441 units of blood, which is so much, it's just crazy. Um, and um, it was 48 hours before all of the victims were identified. Um, so also just looking at the incident scene, anything that um, you guys can help bring with the patient or, or help us to provide um, identification or to, to aid in identification, um, is, is very valuable. So I'm just going to break down um, how our hospital responds upon event, upon notification that there is an event occurring. Um, we have our charge nurse in the emergency department and um, that charge nurse will notify security that an event is happening. And sometimes we hear about these events through EM resource. Sometimes we hear about them from, from you guys calling the bio phone, um, sometimes just social media. Um, a variety of ways. Um, we notify trauma services. We have a, a trauma services page out that we send for any trauma need. Um, and then MCI would definitely be one of those that we would page them out for. Um, we, we ask the charge nurse to consider any C. Bernie exposure um, concerns so that we can determine if we need to open our decontamination areas or not. Um, we huddle with our PEM, who is our pediatric emergency medicine physician and our house supervisor, um, just to give situation, situational awareness and um, determine next steps. Um, we huddle with our team to um, provide situational awareness to them and assign roles within our incident command structure. We designate a triage area um, and a team to really man that casualty collection point. And um, we start working on clearing the department. Our house supervisor, um, then goes into action. She, I say she, but it could be a he, <laughs> our health supervisor. Um, they sent out a conference call. It's a, it's a conference bridge um, that really pulls our key leaders together. So our administrator on call and um, our hospital leadership that can really help us get some resources. 
um, notifies them of what's happening. She um, talks to the OR and we determine if we need to hold any elective OR cases so that we can keep the ORs open. Um, trauma services in the OR have a really great process that they do in communication um, for any trauma that's coming in. So um, that would be maximized at that point. And, um, and our health supervisor really facilitates decontaminate or de decompression. So um, freeing up beds in our ICUs and our inpatient units and um, just really considers allocation of resources, how we can best spread our resources across the organization to um, respond to the event. Um, we outlined three different phases or types of NCI, MCIs um, in our um, policies. And this is really to help us um, activate and identify what kind of resources we need. So a phase one MCI in our world is really um, an MCI that department resources are adequate to manage. So this might be a car accident. We're getting five um, patients, maybe three of them are green, one's yellow and one's red. That's something that we could really handle um, just with our normal resources. So that would be a phase one MCI. A phase two, we know that we're gonna need some additional resources to manage the situ situation. And depending on what time of day it is and what resources are available, we may be able to do that with our internal resources um, and activating those. And then a phase three event is that really bad day that we know that our resources are gonna become overwhelmed quickly. Um, we need internal and external resources. We need to um, consider calling back staff um, that are on their day off to come support and um, support from our other locations. And then just kind of to break down in emergency management talk, um, we, for our space, we clear the ED. So essentially what we do is, you know, every day we see a lot of patients that don't actually have an emergency medical condition. Um, they're here for other reasons. <laughs> and so we can um, provide, we can uh, des designate providers to go around and, um, and just really medically screen all of those patients that don't have an emergency medical condition you know, your ear pains, your sore throats, um, all those things, and just um, clear them out of our ED, and then um, really work to admit our patients that are in the ED holding for beds. Look at our time. Um, the OR, they need to um, look at their elective surgeries and see how they can alter their schedule to absorb these patients. Our ICU, they um, run their board, looking at all of their patients, um, what patients are stable enough that they could be moved out to a step-down unit or to our um, inpatient acute care units um, just to clear up ICU space and staff. Um, and then our acute care also, um, just looking what they can do to absorb those ICU patients, um, absorb patients from the emergency department, um, and um, clear space also. Our staff, um, we pull staff from all of our ancillary departments so um, maybe from the NICU or from our um, outpatient clinics and pair them with emergency department staff so that um, we can just expand our resources at that time. Um, mass notification, we have um, a system called Everbridge that we can send out a mass notification to staff. They can respond um, to that notification and say whether they're available to come in or not. And then we can deploy them to come in or to be on standby for us. Um, and supplies, right? Um, depending on the situation and the type of event, um, we need essential supplies in the triage area. Um, we have supplies on the unit that we can um, access and then we can notify our materials management to replenish those. Um, and then just really thinking about what do we need to set up those alternative care units such as turning our waiting room into a treatment area or um, the, the um, procedure center, something like that, so that we can open alternative care areas. Um, a little bit about assessment progression. So we do that initial um, disaster triage, which is really just sorting of patients. And in this area, we really emphasize to staff that this is not a treatment area. Um, we are just doing those initial life-saving interventions and sorting them and moving on. Um, if we start doing um, resuscitations or starting IVs in this area, it's really going to bottleneck and jeopardize the system from our whole goal of um, saving as many lives as possible. Um, then we move on to our patient assessment. So this is really after the stabilizing interventions. This is after a patient has been sorted and um, maybe they're in that yellow category and we're doing a full patient assessment. 
Um, as Tim mentioned, salt triage can be 56% effective, so patients will probably need to be moved um, categories. We will find that red patients maybe um, with a brief intervention are not red anymore, and we may find that green patients are sicker than we initially thought. Um, so practicing uh, moving patients from category to category. And then our ongoing assessment, our tertiary assessment, is really the assessment of resources um, in comparison to the patient's condition and the patient's needs. So as our resources increase or change, um, we can change what we can do for patients. And um, as the patient's condition changes, we also um, need to identify resources that are now needed that weren't. So it's kind of that reassessment all the time. Um, as my, um, as the Orlando um, example, you know, if we run out of chest tubes and somebody doesn't get a chest tube, then when we get that supply replenished, we may have to go back and, and put a chest tube in patients who, um, who needed one and weren't able to get one because we didn't have them. So kind of that constant reassessment of what we can do for patients. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit, looking at the time, um, about that expectant um, black tag triage category. Um, it's really difficult. And while our primary goal of the MCI should be to maximize the number of live saves, really um, our civil society, our natural instincts, um, this really demands a secondary goal of minimizing the physical and psychological suffering of those impacted. And when I say those impacted, it's not just our patients, it's also um, us um, who are caring and who are impacted by this disaster in a way um, that we are by caring for them. Um, those who have not survived or are likely to not survive just can't really be assigned to a holding area and unmanned. Um, hospitals tend to, tend to say, oh, we have um, our black area and we just put, we'll just put our patients there. And really a lot more discussion doesn't come up about that. And the reality of it is, is that um, that black category just can't be ignored. Um, it has to be manned. Now, when resources are scarce and the patient's condition is dire, palliative care offers a humane and medically appropriate treatment choice. Um, palliative care offers us an alternative to doing nothing for these patients, which feels horrible. Um, and using a whole bunch of resources um, that we need to save other lives um, on an outcome that we know is going to be poor. Um, both of those feel terrible, and um, palliative care really offers us a choice. Palliative care is really all about um, death with dignity and um, comfort in death, and um, recognizing that sometimes we need to um, provide medications and comfort rather than life-saving interventions is a really hard place to come to, but a really important place. Um, we at Children's Hospital have been working with our REACH team, which is our palliative care team, to identify um, palliative care experts that could be on call for us during um, such an event um, that would go out on our MCI pages and they could come and um, resource this, this category for us, this area for us. Um, we have interests from um, social work and chaplains and behavioral health specialists um, that could really do a lot for these patients um, in addition to just pain medications. Um, I know that, that the EMS community that you guys face um, this palliative care um, population more often than just at an MCI. I know that you face them, um, you know, with DNR patients where the families um, get really scared or um, they just don't know what to do. And, and even though, you know, those patients are on hospice or they do have DNRs, um, they call you guys. And um, it's, I know it's something you deal with more than just mass casualty. Um, Yeah, so just really thinking about that, and um, you know, if your if your system doesn't have resources or um, you know protocols in place to think about how we treat these victims differently than we do regular patients, um, I think it's it's important to do that, and um, we are here to help you to do that with our resources. Um, and just to elaborate on that, yeah, the, um, the initial care provided to these seriously ill patients or these hospice patients by EMS, you guys really um, set a, a trajectory for these patients that could be life prolonging 
um, that maybe weren't wishes. So just pausing to really identify what, what the family needs and what should be happening at this time um, is, really, is really important. Let me skip over that. Um, recognizing stressors in um, ourselves and in our teams and um, supporting our own you know, recognizing that we are experiencing really a communal trauma. When we go through any kind of, um, it doesn't have to be a mass casualty, it's just maybe a really traumatic um, call that, that you guys go on together, recognizing that you're not the only one who maybe feels um, some emotional pain from that event, that um, your team may be also, um, and really looking at how we can help each other and how we can help ourselves. So, you know, during the event or um, right at the event, um, there's three categories that we can really look at and it's the fear of basic needs. So um, I'm working really hard. When am I gonna eat next? Am I safe to care for these patients? And is my family safe? You know, that's one of the stressors, um, one category of stressors that you could be feeling during such an event. Um, uncertainty, like how long will this go on for? Um, am I enough? Um, am I enough to make these decisions? Am I enough to save this life? Am I enough to care for these people? Um, it can be really hard to, um, to struggle, to wrestle with. Um, will I be supported if I make decisions? Um, will my organization, will, will I be supported by my teammates, my leadership? Um, will I be able to make these difficult decisions that we talk about in categorizing patients? And then processing, right? Processing that this is a grief and a loss, um, not being able to do everything doing everything you can and it not being enough in itself causes some grief. Um, of course, we have PTSD from these events. That I think probably all people in the medical field who have been walking this path for a while carry around with us, um, but really just post-traumatic growth also. Um, you know, it, it's stunting what we know we can do and what our potential is because we're afraid of more tr trauma in our lives. Um, catching our breath and just um, reflecting on the impact while, um, while still facing it is very difficult. Um, resiliency for ourselves. I mean, traditionally, we really don't, um, we really don't appreciate the impact that these disasters have on frontline mental health, or on frontline workers their, on their mental health. And over the past several years, um, as we do more research and as we do more um, resiliency work, we have found that um, it is very important to acknowledge the stressors that are um, on us and on our teams and um, providing support um, in resilience building, um, encouraging breaks, and providing resources to our team such as buddy systems and wellness check-ins. Um, and these are before, during, and after an incident. And uh, we really want to create a culture where we can support each other. So even if there is a debriefing happening or a resiliency opportunity and you maybe don't feel like you necessarily need it, um, participating in those opportunities so that you can bring your expertise and your, um, your lens to a group of maybe people who haven't experienced that before and are trying to deal with it, um, bringing your support it helps us to create a culture where it's, it's okay to talk about these and work through them so that we can be better for our patients um, moving forward so that we can not be broken when we're trying to um, continue our work for them. Um, Ask for Tracy um, is a great resource. They have, um, they have a series of videos for um, behavioral health, for, for health of the healthcare worker and um, it's module one, two, and three, and we can put that um, link in the chat for you. Um, they're just great, like hour long videos, the three of them, and um, it might spear some um, ideas that you can do for your peers and for yourself. And I'm gonna pass it back over to Dan. All right, guys, I'm going to quickly, we're going to end our section a little bit early, but I want to talk about something that has been really important to us as a team here. Children's Hospital realized um, through our work in disaster preparedness that there's a gap missing. We do great trainings, but they're always in clinical spaces. They always disrupt patient care. So as an organization, 
realizing the need for a dedicated disaster training center. So what Children's did um, early last year, I don't know why these guys are sitting behind me now. Um, they're distracting me. Um, what Children's did in December is we took a pre-existing building. As Jason mentioned, we share a space together. Um, what Children's did is we took a pre-existing pre building and designed and built a disaster training center. Um, it's a 13-bed simulated clinical care area that houses the training opportunities, functional practice for low frequency, high risk events that may cause concern if performed in clinical areas or in public places. The benefit of this for this group today is that we encourage our community partners to come in and practice and play and hold trainings and education and drills in this environment where you could practice search and rescue techniques, you could practice response to active shooter situations, um, wide variety of any training or education drill situations that you wanna do in a safe, confined area is the goal there. As you can see a couple of pictures from drills we've done, we have a relatively decent sized conference room. It holds about 20 people pre-COVID. Um, we have 13, like I said, 13 clinical bed spaces, long hallways for um, search and rescue, multiple things. Uh, bottom picture, we're practicing restraining patients. So a great place to be able to just practice those environments and techniques that you can't do um, in other areas. Um, some references Marcy had. So if you are interested in getting into this space, either reach out to Ashley and Jason or one of us, our contacts are listed below. Um, other than that, Jason, that's all we have. All right, Dan, it took me a second to get my mute button undone there. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Tim and Marcy and Dan. That was awesome. Um, we appreciate all the perspective and information. Um, I had one question that came through on the chat and I wanted to get your guys' perspective as well. Um, there was a question about a separate entrance to the ER if they know someone needs decon, but they don't want to contaminate the whole ER. Um, and I know it, hard because we have many facilities, but um, I don't know if you guys want to, one of you want to speak to it um, or you would like me to address it? Yeah, Jason, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so at all of our children's EDs, we do have separate external entrances into our decon showers. The benefit of that is you can call our charge nurse, call our biophones. As you know, a patient's going to need decon and we can open those doors for you. We can take them right into our decon showers, wash them off and take them directly from the showers inside the building so you don't have to worry about going through the ambulance entrance. We'll meet you in the ambulance bay, take over the patient from right there, no worry about contamination into our building at any of our locations. Thanks, Dan. And you know, I think one of the keys there is since every facility is different and that's not, you know, not any different than any of the other hospital systems or freestanding EDs or whatever that looks like. I mean, every place is different. So I think the key there is just communication. And so making sure that you guys from an EMS standpoint are addressing that on your phone call to us, just giving us the heads up, whether it's on the biophone or if you don't have the time or the manpower to do that, just calling your dispatch and having dispatch contact our ED. Um, and so that our staff can come out, even if you are on the border of, you know, do we need this? Does it need a full decon? Maybe they don't. If you have any questions or concerns, just mention it to us. Um, and then our staff can come out and meet you out in the bay and kind of figure it out from there. No one um, should ever, ever give you a hard time about any concerns you might have if it ultimately it wasn't warranted or needed to do a full decon, uh, even though maybe you mentioned it. Um, no one should give you a hard time about that. We should all be supporting each other um, and making sure that we're prepared for every situation. So uh, just make sure you communicate that to us when you're bringing the patient in um, and, and we will be out there to assist you into the decon area so that we don't have to traipse them through the main ED. But that's a, that's a really great concern. And we're just lucky that our facilities are structured like that. So here's um, the slide with our contact information on there. There's Ashley's and my email, Stacy's email. Um, I know that we have put some resource links in the chat boxes. 
Um, the eval code is also in there. So you can just click on that link um, or you can take a picture of this QR code. It will take you to the eval. You'll put your information in, just a couple quick questions for the eval and then you'll get the PE certificate. So, um, again, I know that's a ton of different information, but um, thank you guys for joining us, this, joining us this morning. We really appreciate all you guys do for kids out there. Um, I hope you all are staying warm and safe. Please take care of yourselves and each other. I hope you guys have a wonderful holidays. Um, and as always, we're just here as a resource. So if you need anything, feel free to email us, call us, uh, anything we can do to help you guys um, to perform your job a little bit better. So take care of yourselves. We'll leave this slide up for just a little bit so you can make sure you record everything down. Um, and we will see you all very, very soon. Happy holidays.